Hare Krishna, Kalkan Pro. Thank you very much for joining today with us. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you. And you know, I also spent some time in the Krishna house, I think two, two and a half years ago. It was one of the most uh, illuminating periods of my Western outreach. So I see you as a very multifaceted person. I came to know about you first through your poetry. You have written the the song divine, which is a very beautiful recitation, a rendition of the Bhagavad Gita in English poetry. In fact, I have memorized many of the verses and I sometimes quote the English translation also in my classes. And uh, then when I came to Krishna house, I also saw how you created one of the few uh, functional and effective models for Western outreach and a model that is repeatable in the sense that you got a, it is of course your personal uh, dedication and vision, but also apart from that, you know, it's, there are the logistics of the model are such that they are replicable. And I was very inspired by that. And recently I know that you also written a book on that topic. So I have, you know, I'm based in India, but I keep traveling abroad and uh, especially the America. So you know, I would like to discuss with you about the challenges and opportunities of when bhakti wisdom is to be presented to the West, to a Western mind, and how you have dealt with those challenges. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about the history of the Krishna house and how you started getting, how you took it up and how it has grown. Then we could discuss about more conceptual things. All right. Very good. Thank you, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. It's so good to see you. Thank you for inviting you. me today. Uh, the, the Krishna House has been going since 1971. It's in Gainesville, Florida, which is a smaller town in the center of Florida, but with a very large university, the University of Florida, which has about 50,000 students. And in, the, in, in 1971, Srila Prabhupada came there. A small group of devotees had arranged a program, and he spent one day and encouraged them to distribute prasadam and hold kirtan on the campus. So they began a prasadam distribution program, which continued without uh, stoppage all the way up until today. Uh, it's called the Krishna Lunch. And when it is in full swing, there'll be as many as 13 or 1400 students who will come and have lunch with the devotees on campus each day. Uh, the devotees hold kirtan, distribute all of this prasadam. And from this, many students take some interest in Krishna consciousness. But like in India, like to get into a good university means a lot of commitment. In America, it's a lot of expense also, an awful lot of expense. So the students are not in position to easily move into an ashram and take up spiritual life. So we, we have... Over the last 15 years, developed a hybrid program called the Bhakti Academy. Now, I should mention that Krishna House in, grew very much like ISKCON in America grew in the 70s. Many devotees joined, and they had all kinds of dynamic programs. Uh, later, the administration shifted the main temple out to Alachua, which is a suburb of Gainesville. And that project oh, so has Krishna developed. Krishna House a, started before, sorry, just to interrupt you. Krishna yes. House started before the Alachua Temple? Oh, yes, many years before. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. At least five or six years before. Oh, and, okay. uh, and then Alachua developed very dynamically in the 80s as a place for Grihastas to come for education of their children. So now the Alachua Temple is very large. The community has about 1,000 members. I think and it must the, be the largest uh, devotee community in, the, in North America, isn't it? I believe it is, yes. At least yes. something which is situated in, as a community, not like a scattered congregation. But Correct. A, yeah. Yes, and there, there are uh, two schools that are open to the devotee community and um, a great diversity of projects going on there. Hmm. But Gainesville is an, a separate entity. It's a separate corporation and uh, has it's a separate program where we cooperate together. But the, the Krishna House had continued the Krishna lunch, but the number of people coming and joining and becoming devotees had dwindled, as in many temples around America, as you know. Mm. Most of the temples shifted from 
having resident devotees who would raise income through book sales or incense sales to more of a congregationally based movement. So all of the mm. temples in America have made that transition over the last 20 or 30 years, 40 years since Prabhupada's departure. Uh, the Krishna house, however, really had no congregation. It was simply a prasadam distribution center. And the, the residential membership had dwindled to very little. Uh, they had only recruited one new devotee in the past 10 years before I became president in 2006. So in 2008, we, after studying the situation, we opened a small pilot project called the Bhakti Academy and opened mm. some residential rooms to <coughs> students at the University of Florida where they could live in the ashram. They would have to chant eight rounds, follow the regulator principles, but then they pay some, some tuition, uh, attend the morning program, and then go to their classes. It's sort of a hybrid where they could continue their studies without interruption, very much like the base program or yeah. voice program in, in India, uh, although we didn't know about those at the time. Uh, okay. So that started with three students. Next year it was six and 12. Now we have about 30 to 35 students most of the year. And it's a co-educational project. So we have men's ashrams, ladies' ashrams. Uh, many of the students attend the university, but many others do not. Many of them have just come for the ashram experience, the sort of thing that was happening in ISKCON in the 70s that most of us thought was kind of history. So what we've discovered at Krishna House is that if the proper principles are applied, young Westerners, educated Westerners, will, will take part in Krishna consciousness fully, will embrace the philosophy, practice wholeheartedly, take initiation, some cases contribute directly to the mission, in most cases to contribute as congregational members. So we've had since then about 325 students who have been trained and graduated from the Bhakti Academy. Um, so that, that has been a wonderful experience for me as a career preacher in North America. Uh, I, I now have learned how by following what Srila Prabhupada did in the very early days of ISKCON, we can have the same sort of results that he had back in the 70s. It's not drawn, that part of ISKCON's history. It's just that we moved ahead to a certain point by 1977, a lot of cultural overlays, and then when Srila Prabhupada departed, the threshold for joining ISKCON had become very high. And with the confusion and the leadership and without Prabhupada's personal presence, the appeal dwindled. So by just going, turning the clock back to the 60s, the late 60s rather than the mid-70s, we have found that the same things that Prabhupada did are still effective in bringing Western people into Christian consciousness. May I show you a picture of our last graduating class? Yeah, please. Okay, this will give you more of a visual idea. Of, this was our class in uh, the. This was in January of this year. So oh. you see these these students are um, from a diverse background. Uh, mostly they're young and they're early to mid twenties. Um, most of them are very new to Krishna consciousness within. Uh, three months to three years, let's say, and uh, bright, enthusiastic, educated young men and women who have made a real contribution to developing Krishna consciousness already in North America. So this is our, this is our mission and our purpose, to continually bring in and train quality young men and women and introduce them to Prabhupada's movement. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that, Ru. So when you say graduating, is it a one-year course or a two-year course? How long is it, the Bhakti Academy course? M the minimum is three months, and there is no maximum. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So when you say, these are, are these graduating students or they are participating students? The, the, those who are, were in that picture were all participating students. Participating students, yeah. okay, yeah. So just to put this in a little perspective, now, the number 325 from an Indian perspective might not seem very big because yeah. <laughs> in India we have, uh, if we have one youth camp, 
as we had the pune has an annual youth retreat in mayapur that has probably more 500 600 youth every year but i have been to america and i've seen that it's so difficult in fact dutakarma pro told me that he wrote a wrote a paper called the a dystopian scenario from the 2050 and he said we would be writing the obituary of the last western devotee in our movement <laughs> <laughs> so the way it is going we have very few devotees joining who are who are americans the mm-hmm. movement is going on primarily because of the indians so Absolutely. it's not many devotees joining 325 over a period of uh, 15 years that is a this is started in 2006 you said so roughly maybe uh, the course started in 2008 Yes, yeah, so about 12, yeah, the last 12 13 years. So 12 13 years. So it is a significant number. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, what happened that uh, the outreach has gone down substantially since the time of Prabhupad because at the time mm-hmm. of Prabhupad we had only western devotees practically very few Indians. Yes. yes. Now and even in India iskon was filled with western devotees. Indians became life members but not really devote devote committed devotees. so but now even in america we have more indians than non indians so you mentioned a couple of points one was that the threshold became very high mm. uh, so could you explain that and other factors that led to this yes yes i, I i've been participating in iskon since 1972 so i've had a chance to kind of witness this first hand mm. in the at that time when i joined and for the years before that iskon was a uh small is kind of centers i should say were small mostly rented buildings with a a warm family atmosphere among all of the devotees and that had a tremendous appeal to to be able to live in a communal way uh with with spiritually minded young men and women in a stimulating uh spiritually enlivening environment that was what was drawing people in the early days of this kind Mm. and the the main shift as i saw came when more and more devotees started going to india so of course some devotees had been in india since the late 60s uh but in 1972 3 4 probably held the first mayapur festival in 1974 um then as the western devotees went to india and some stayed for some time they understood the higher and more subtle levels of culture around the the vaishnav tradition and they also saw the logistics of indian civilization or indian society that were so much different than the west hmm. so they kind of adopted these practices and brought them back to america and said if you really want to be krishna conscious these are the things you should do and that was a a new threshold of cultural standards for the devotees which were embraced very freely but the impact on newcomers was kind of an unintended consequence now not only a newcomer would need to follow four regular principles and chant 16 rounds but they would be expected to to dress uh strictly in the the uh, traditional style they would adopt cultural mannerism speech that became part of the lexicon of the the uh krishna community and advanced devotees were more acculturated in indian culture therefore the younger devotees felt pressured to make more of a transition in their own personal life and behavior can you so, give examples of what you would mean because in one sense if you consider the dress i would hmm. say that prabhupad himself introduced the dress yes and prabhupad was quite uh, proud of proud in the spiritual sense of yes. both the fact that even when he himself went to the west he did not change his dress although yes. some of his god brothers did that when they went to london and he hmm. was also proud he writes in his books also that when india, his disciples came to india one of the things that attracted people so much to prabhupad was that even the western disciples had adopted the in not just the indian wisdom or the bhakti internally but also mm-hmm. the culture externally 
So then yes. what exactly was imported from India, which was well, given by Prabhupada? Th- think back to, uh, you've, you've read Prabhupada Lilamrita. Yeah. The, the uh, planting the seed volume. Yes. So, th- so th- think back to Prabhupada on 26 Second Avenue. Do you, there was no introduction of dotis. He, uh, one, one devotee put, put them on and put one on and Prabhupada said that was fine if he wanted to wear it. But he did not uh, uh, make anyone feel obliged. They were free to adopt it if they wished, but they were free not to adopt it if they didn't wish. And it was not an issue. You see? So dress is one example. By the time in the mid-70s, it was just expected that if you were going to uh, be participating uh, actively, you would expect to wear these clothes, uh, have a shaven head. Uh, that was one visible difference. So you're saying uh, this, this, that we should do it did not come from Prabhupada? No, but I'm, I'm saying that it was not there originally. It, it's one example of how the cultural threshold increased. Okay. So the, the, in 26 Second Avenue, there was no such requirement, no such expectation. He simply said, you just come and hear and take part in the kirtan and take part in the feast. Wear what you like. And, and the devotees accepted that. If they wished, they could also wear Indian style clothing, but they were not obliged. So I'm trying to help, help you understand that distinction. Okay. So this going, is what going we, this from is the what freedom we do. of choice. This, this is what we do. And if you like, yeah. you can do it. But even if you don't do it, still you can yes. join and you can be a part of us. Correct. Okay. That's the, that's the difference from 1967 to 1977. <laughs> By 1977, it was not an option. You, you're going to be a devotee. You're going to dress this way. Um, <clears throat> now, so let me ask I'm you. I'm struggling with the idea that this, okay. Didn't, okay. this came from India and it didn't come from Prabhupada because from one no, no. incident. It, yeah. It, you see, this is the thing. This is the thing that I, I've understood from this experience, Prabhu, that ISKCON is a work in progress even now, but very much then. Okay. And as you recall, Prabhupada <clears throat> would gradually introduce various things. And sometimes he would try things. And then if it didn't work, he would abandon them and do something else. For example, he established a Gurukula in Dallas. But mm. the, the government authorities were not supportive, so he transferred the Gurukula to Vrindavan. Yeah. Um, then there are many examples, many examples. He, he was not static. He would try things. If they didn't work, he would try something else. So th- there's a word called ideation, where you freeze a moment in time and say, this is how it should always be forever and ever. So when, when Srila Prabhupada left uh, physically in 1977, first bear in mind that his elder devotees were in their early 30s. I mean, the elder devotees, the the uh, average devotees were maybe in their late 20s. I mean, I'm talking about those senior leaders. And most of the devotees were in their late teens or early 20s. So there were not very experienced, mature people in charge when he turned the movement over to their care. Therefore, this sense of ideation was there where we're frozen. Okay, this is how it is now. This is how it should always be. And... Uh, let me give you another example. When, when she, well, you remember Srila Prabhupada's declaration at the end of his physical manifest pastimes. Uh, it, he wanted to go back to America to establish Varnashram. Yeah. Now, uh, Abhiram Prabhu was Prabhupada's uh, traveling companion at that time and mm. one of his entourage. And I've interviewed him extensively about this. He said what was happening was that many of the devotees had adopted the uh, intense renunciation of brahmacharya and sannyas, uh, but were regularly proving unqualified to do so. Yeah. And as these reports came into Prabhupada, one after the next, of uh, his sannyasis falling down, he, he, for their concern and for the women and children and for introducing Krishna consciousness on a wider scale, he said, now let me introduce Varnashram. 
The other 50%, he said, I've established 50% book distribution. Now let me establish the other 50%. My work is not mm. finished. So what was that for? Well, this was to accommodate people for a life in Krishna consciousness. So uh, my friend Seisha Prabhu and I were on our way to Gitanagari to see Srila Prabhupada there. But as you know, he did not make it. He had to go back to Vrindavan mm. after only going as far as London. So what he meant by Varnashram has been widely debated ever since. <laughs> mm. And But this is an example of how the, the movement was not fully manifest at that time. And this this moment in time was not the pinnacle of everything Prabhupada wanted ISKCON to be. He left it in our hands, in other words, to expand things further. So, so let's, let's just go forward a little bit, if we may, to, to yeah. get back to your question about why the, the North American temples are primarily supported by the Indian community. So what I, happened was... I like this point about ideation. Okay. Somehow I, I, I had thought about this, that we live in the past too much. Um, yes. But I never thought that there could be a significant difference between the 1960s and the 1970s. And we, yes. have, we are stuck in, not only in the past when Prabhupada was there, but in a particular phase when Prabhupada was there in the past. Exactly. Exactly. And Krishna House has been successful because we turned the clock back 10 years and did the things that Prabhupada did on the Lower East Side in 1967. Those things still work for bringing in Westerners. But what we were doing in 1977, and we've been trying to do ever since, that has proven to be a failure as far as recruiting Westerners is concerned. It has d it diminished to practically nothing. So um, after Prabhupada's departure, there was a lot of chaos, first of all, for about 10 years. Mm. Uh, and that's, as, as he writes in the fourth canto, that's to be expected. And then the, the GBC kind of righted the ship has been working ever since then to get the proper juxtaposition between the authority of the GBC and the authority of gurus. Um, and while all this was going on, the number of people joining diminished tremendously. And as a result, the revenues for the temples also diminished tremendously. The temples were established by the hard work of these young recruits going out and selflessly raising money, collecting money, mostly through book sales, often through selling of other paraphernalia. So they were able to purchase the real estate, establish the deity worship. But then they, in most cases, went on to establish their own grihasta lives. And there were no replacements coming up behind them. But the temples, meanwhile, had become popular with the Indian immigrant uh, population. You know, the, the immigration for Indians coming to America just opened at the same time Prabhupada went, 1965-66. And now the, the Indian minority in America is the, the most wealthy per capita and best educated of all the various ethnic groups in the United States. So these successful, very highly educated people appreciated the temples and began coming. And being intelligent, they could see that the, the uh, support of the temple was, temples were floundering in some cases or, or shaky. So they stepped forward and organized in congregations and took the process very seriously, took initiation. Many of our temples in North America are now led not by resident temple presidents or full-time uh, preachers, you could say, but those who are working as congregational volunteers. So the, the Indian community, the diaspora in, in North America has saved all of the temples. There are, none of them have closed all from Prabhupada's time. There are, all the ones that he had opened are still going, plus more. So... <clears throat> that part, the congregational support, is the new revenue structure by which the temples are going on. But mm. the impact of the movement on the, you could say, indigenous population <laughs> has, has dropped uh, dramatically. And even those devotees who are from the Indian congregation who are now leaders in our temples are asking, how do we reach the Westerners? They see. They, they don't want it to be an ethnic religion, because we all understand this was not Lord Chaitanya's vision. So there's 
uh, was it Hegel, the, the uh, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Yeah. So the, the thesis is that Westerners can be Vaishnavas. Uh, the antithesis is that those of Indian descent will be Vaishnavas more easily. <laughs> so the synthesis will be those who are of Indian heritage work with those of uh, non-Indian heritage together to make the movement widely uh, accessible and appealing to the whole population. In, in nonprofit management, the principle is the more that your nonprofit organization looks like the community in which it exists, the more successful it is. In other words, if your nonprofit ha is relevant to all sorts of different groups and uh, subsets of a local community, <clears throat> then you are doing well. So we all recognize that it's very limiting <clears throat> to have our, our uh, devotee communities primarily from one segment of society. So our, 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 okay. the synthesis is if we apply what Prabhupada did in the 60s in the Lower East Side, what Prabhupada of Indian descent did, it can appeal to all cross sections of society. Okay. Thank you for that succinct history of ISKCON and, uh, and especially in the West. Now, were there, there were practical logistical factors by which our demographic shifted to Indians, mm -hmm. uh, but were there also broader cultural factors because of which our appeal to Westerners went down? Because maybe when Prabhupada came, the counterculture was there. And by yes. the 1970s, the counterculture had more or less died out. And right. uh, somehow it seems uh, we have never been able to reach to or even appeal to the mainstream American mind. It's usually people who are a little disenfranchised or a little disillusioned. It is those are the kind of people, uh, Westerners who come to our movement. Whereas the Indians who come to our movement, at least in the West, are people who are already well established, as you said, they're the, they're the wealthiest and the most educated minority. So is it something to, uh, so the dropping of the Westerners in our movement, uh, how much is it affected by the broader cultural changes in America? And uh, did you also need to address that to consider how we can get Westerners to come again? We really did not, and I'll tell you why. Manusyanam uh, Sahasreshu, out of thousands of people, there'll be one who is interested in spiritual life, you know? And those people who are interested in spiritual life are in all segments of society. They're, they come from all walks of life and all backgrounds. So when, they, when a, a couple wants to conceive a child in, in Krishna consciousness, they practice certain samskaras to create the proper environment where a suitable soul will be attracted. Mm. So in the same way, at Krishna House, we worked on establishing an atmosphere where spiritually minded people would be welcome and, and would want to take part in, in the process, in bhakti. Uh, and when you make devotees, we use this phrase, let's make devotees. You can't make them like Dr. Frankenstein, you know, put mm. together pieces, assemble them and then charge them with electricity. Uh, if, if we could do that, it would give a whole new meaning to the phrase, all glories to the assembled devotees. <laughs> oh God, assemble. <laughs> That's clever. <laughs> Uh, so it's quite a mechanized uh, <laughs> usage of words and making a devotee is yes yeah. yes mm. so <clears throat> what we have done instead is create an environment that is attractive for spiritually minded people and those people then come from all walks of life all sorts of backgrounds rich and poor educated and simple older younger the attractive uh, factor is the spiritual enthusiasm of the devotees and the, the clarity of the process and the accessibility of it and the reduction of those cultural thresholds. 
where you don't have to join anything. You don't have to change anything. Just add Krishna. Just add Krishna and then take it from there. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. We, you we you feel like our process can be shared independent of the broader cultural context. Whatever changes may be there, Correct. Uh, whether it is counterculture or whether it is uh, millennials or gen generation X or Z or whatever, it's always yes. going to be the people who are going to be interested in serious spirituality are going to be few. And those few are always going to be there. So if we just right. provide a, a conducive environment, they will come. Yes. They'll be attracted. Exactly. Okay. That's interesting. Uh, and now going further about the conducive environment. So one was with respect to the dress and uh, are there any other factors which uh, you had to take care of? When I came to yeah. Krishna house for the first time, Mm. Or maybe it was the second time after the class we were talking, and you said to something, we you said some, something to me which actually I wondered whether it was an appreciation or a criticism. <laughs> mm? So you were encouraging me to uh, to also spend time in the West, and you felt that I could be effective in reaching to a Western audience, and then I asked you why do you feel like that. So you said at that time that. Uh, you know, the first thing you said, you said several things. The first thing you said is that you are not uncomfortable around women. Mm. So as a Brabajari from India, I thought, is this, I really thought whether it is, whether it is, a, it is a criticism or appreciation. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the gender dynamics are quite different in, in India and in the West. Was yeah. that also a fact? I think one, you mentioned also that you are a, a co-education over there. Yes. So was that also a factor which you had to consider? Yes. Let, let me ask you, when, when we, we talk about Srila Prabhupada's innovations in introducing Krishna consciousness in the West, what is inevitably at or near the top of the list? What innovation? In, you know, uh, well, initiating non-Indians to become Brahmanas or sannyasis. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, giving uh, Brahman Diksha to women. The engaging mm. women basically in various ways. Yes. Crossing the yeah. ocean and going to the West, building right. temples without necessarily conforming to traditional architectural norms about how temples are to be built. Mm. Many things. Yes. Yeah. I, so, but specifically, the, this innovation of allowing women to not only take diksha, but to reside in temples. That was the, nearly unheard of in India. But he said, these women are approaching me, they're sincere souls, what can I do? So in 1968, he directed that all the centers should have Brahmacharini ashrams. And they did. And the all women... All the centers? Yes. Yes, he wrote to Satsuruk Maharaj. He said, this idea of a Brahmacharini ashram is very good. All of our centers should have one. He also in, wrote in... In fact, I'm really surprised to hear this because... But I have been to ISKCON temples where there are Brahmachari ashrams mm -hmm. and they have a serious policy that no unmarried women can stay alone in the temples, even in the guest rooms. And we're, so, we're talking about temples in, in, the, uh, in, in the West or in, in, in India? Uh, of course, India. Yeah. I'm talking about temples in India. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, so th this I think is in another India, we don't example. have any, con any concept of Brahmachari ashram at all, yeah. except yes. maybe one or two places in North. And up in north, I think one one place as far as I know. Yeah. yeah. This is another example, Prabhu, of the the cultural import from India, uh, that, that and how it impacted ISKCON in the West. Uh, have you read Jamuna's biography, uh, uh, yeah. Unalloyed Devotion? Yeah. So she has a very detailed description there of her time in India. She used to sit right in the front, in front of Srila Prabhupada every day when he gave lectures. <clears throat> and then one, a newly uh, initiated sannyasi told her that, no, you have to sit in the back because in India, the women sit in the back. So she sat, the next day she sat in the back and then Prabhupada asked her, you don't like my lectures anymore? And, and she said, no, I love them very much, but I was told I have to sit in the back. So at, at that time, they who had been very close 
understood between them that their relationship was going to change be because of India, ISKCON's new presence in India. And it would have to be a more of a subtle relationship based on Vani rather than the mm. Vapu uh, association. But Prabhupada was very close with his young female Western disciples in terms of mentoring them, uh, training them. You know, he, 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 he was criticized for this by his god brothers. But as he, as he writes in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, the Lord Chaitanya took sannyas, he said, for the purpose of engaging the impersonalists and getting the respect of people in general in society. So he, he came up with these means that were appropriate for the time and circumstance. And then he said, so people are not aware in, in India that in the West, young men and women interact very freely. So you cannot suddenly impose one set of cultural values upon another, he writes. Therefore, we have taken the process of engaging these women in Krishna consciousness, and they have done wonderfully. So they, they are preaching Krishna consciousness, uh, and they are as good as their brothers. So the Chaitanya Charitamrita is Prabhupada's, in many respects, it's his mature uh, commentary on spreading Krishna consciousness. You know, Srimad Bhagavatam, he began after, before even uh, starting ISKCON, in the Gita in the early days of ISKCON. Chaitanya Charitamrita, he wrote as the movement had really expanded. And he makes many strong statements in there about the policy of engaging women on an equal footing. However, post Prabhupada's departure, uh, this idea, uh, well, getting back to ideation, in 1977, there was a very strong divide that had arisen between the men and women in this country, in North America. The women were relegated to the backs of the temple rooms. Uh, one, one enthusiastic sannyasi, GBC, in 1976, had convinced the GBC to pass a resolution that all women in ISKCON should go to Australia. That was they, a they joined in America. They should go to Australia because every time a woman would join, he said, we lose a man. In, in those days, the book distribution was done by an army of brahmacharis in vans canvassing the continent. And um, Prabhupada was very pleased with that Radhadamadar traveling party. But the temples, which were run by grihastas usually, were losing all of their men to this traveling party. So they objected. And in Mayapur in 1976, Prabhupada sided with these Grihastha temple presidents. So he, th this is an example of how the movement was still unfolding in Prabhupada's presence. But what, by, still by 1977, there was a tremendous marginalization of women in the movement. Uh, the, w women were relegated to the backs of temples. Uh, the devotees were under the impression that this is Indian culture, this is really advanced Vaishnava culture. And uh, with the, that power of ideation, that's how it stayed. <laughs> that's how temples have sort of looked at things ever since. Now, the, in 2000, the, the women, mostly senior devotees, Prabhupada disciples, presented to the GBC that, that, that we are not being treated properly. Uh, we, we are not able to approach the deities. We're not able to approach Prabhupada's Vyasasan. The newest bhakta will come and offer flowers to Prabhupada before his female disciples who have been serving for 20 or 30 years are allowed to do so. So the GBC made adjustments. They apologized for the mistreatment of women. Uh, I, I'm just speaking on the most superficial level. It actually went much, much deeper. All sorts of exploitation, abuse, um, the the uh, anyway without going to more detail the GBC issued an apology public apology and took steps to rectify the treatment of women so this was a this improved things but at the same time it did not bring about a, a an actual sense of equality that existed in the early days of this time now on 26 Second Avenue there was only a handful of young ladies who were coming so there was no ashram for them. But in San Francisco, the second temple that was started, there were many young ladies, so they had facility to stay. Most of them were grihastas, but not all. 
And Prabhupada saw their effectiveness and their value and, and importance in spreading Krishna consciousness. So at Krishna House, we turned back the clock. We gave equal treatment, equal facility to men and women. That, Prabhu, has been by far the most successful uh, adjustment we have made that has brought Westerners into Krishna consciousness. We lost that mood from the San Francisco days in the Radha Damodar days. But when we just reinstate that same mood, everything works again. Mm, beautiful. So, so uh, I, I just want to say, this was not a criticism of you <laughs> to say that you were comfortable around women. It was very much a glorification. <laughs> yeah, I got that from the context. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. So it's interesting. Again, I really need to process this a little bit more about ideation in 77 and 67. Sometimes from a distance, we have almost like a monolithic understanding of Prabhupada that, and Prabhupada's times. And now you also made another point that uh, Prabhupada's uh, Chaitanya Charita Amrit commentary is more his mature, uh, his mature realizations of what it takes to spread Krishna consciousness. This I also thought about this that, you know, is there a evolution in Prabhupada's thought? Uh, now the core principles are not going; they are, they are going to be eternally the same, but we do see some amount of evolution. Now, often it's a uh, Say, for example, Prabhupada in the 1960s did say that Varanashram has become the caste system and it has failed and we just need to share Krishna consciousness directly. But in the 1970s, he said that, yeah, we will need Varanashram. So there, are, there is a difference in, this. there are some differences like that. Now, in some ways, we could say that Prabhupada became a little more... Uh, some of the Prama Prabhupada statements go towards becoming a little stronger. For example, in, in, in the respect to his position on science and uh, how atheism is being propagated in the name of science, he seems to become much stronger. Easy journey to other planets has a very non-confrontational tone. Whereas in the 1976-77, some of his classes, they seem to have a much more confrontational mood to them. And even life comes from life also, although that's a different saga, you know, that book has not been most accurately represented. But uh, the, so, we, so, so the conventional understanding is that, or at least what I grew up with is that as, as the movement matured, Prabhupada also tried to take it more and more toward the tradition. So what he did initially was the adjustment which was required for that time. But what he did later was that was he tried to bring it back to the tradition. And because he was representing the tradition, so, so in a sense, he would have wanted us to go back toward the tradition. Just like in the Quran, they have the idea that Muhammad gave the earlier revelations and the later revelations. So the later revelations are considered to be uh, more binding. The later cancels the, to some extent the lesser. Now, now, Prabhupada never specifically said like that. But I've heard this argument being made that you know, what Prabhupada wanted, we see in the later stages. So you are saying, in the, if you consider Chaitanya Charitama to be a later book, so it is Prabhupada actually is more accommodating or more... Uh, so if you consider the evolution of Prabhupada's thoughts, so you are saying that it now, not necessarily it's gone towards more toward the tradition, but it's also gone more toward the adaptation. I hope I articulated myself clearly. Yes. Yes, very, very much so. The, the uh, realization I have, Prabhu, is that Prabhupada was very pragmatic. Of course, no one can understand Prabhupada in full. But if we look at Prabhupada's life objectively, he was interested in what worked. So what was working? What was working in, in, in 1977, uh, people were joining. Uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm. So many books were going out. But if, how would Prabhupada feel today if he were to come to these same temples and see that the congregations were almost entirely from the Indian community? 
I mean, he would be very happy to see them, no doubt. But he would also be asking, where are the other segments of the population? Mm. For example, when he went to Africa in Kenya, the devotees had found support from the Indian diaspora. But then he asked, where are the locals? And he, he even insisted on a program being held where they would come more readily. And then he got them to come in. Uh, in, in England, the same thing. The devotees initially found some interested uh, Indian expatriates in, in England, and were, they were giving some support and encouragement. The Prabhupada directed them, no, you have to reach the lo local population. Mm. So it, it's, it's the elephant in the room, but very bluntly, how would Prabhupada feel today? You visited all the temples, so many temples in North America, and you've seen the congregations. How would he feel? How would he, what would he say? Hmm. So this, this is, I mean, the, te the, the Indian congregations in North America have not only saved the temples, they've expanded and improved them exponentially. But as I mentioned, even the leaders in these temples are asking, okay, how can we reach the Western devotees? Or how can we reach the Western population, the Western youth? How can we reach them? So this is the synthesis. If the leaders, okay. educated, capable people from the Indian community can apply what Prabhupada did in the 60s, the, what the youth will still come. Okay. Uh, now, but I, I want to address your point, Prabhuji, this, the bigger point about the tradition. Is advancement in Krishna consciousness movement going back to being more traditional? And yeah, the, many, many devotees make this argument. I say, I say our experience in Krishna House proves exactly the opposite. Uh, if I may, I'd like to read a quote from the Chaitanya Charitamrita. And mm. take me just a minute to get it on the screen. Or to get it up to read. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Srila Prabhupada writes in the Madhya Leela, chapter 23, verse 105. To broadcast the cult of Krishna consciousness... One has to learn the possibility of renunciation in terms of country, time, and candidate. A candidate for Krishna consciousness in the Western countries should be taught about the renunciation of material existence. But one would teach candidates from a country like India in a different way. The Acharya has to consider time, candidate, and country. He must avoid the principle of Niyamagraha. That is, he should not try to perform the impossible. What is possible in one country may not be possible in another. The Acharya's duty is to accept the essence of devotional service. There may be a little change here and there as far as proper renunciation is concerned. So th this is the thesis on which Krishna uh, House has been successful. Mm, you cannot teach... Support. Yes, you can't teach renunciation. You can't teach Krishna consciousness the same way to a person from one culture as you would from another. You have to make adjustments. So the role of women is, is the first and by far most effective adjustment to make if we want to reach Westerners. Um, I've been accused by many of being a feminist. Feminism means that there should be bodily equality. I don't believe in that. However, I do believe in spiritual equality and I mostly believe uh, the, the most nectarian thing in my life is seeing intelligent young boys and girls from all sorts of backgrounds coming to Krishna consciousness. Uh, and, and I believe that is Prabhupada's vision as well. He, that's what he would want to see. So what is the role? What is, how, how do we equalize the role of women in a way that makes it appealing to them? Uh, this is very important because we have found that if young women move in the ashram, young men move in the ashram also. Mm. Without young women, there is no family atmosphere. And the appeal to young men is greatly reduced as far as the Westerners are concerned. It's interesting. So you're saying that it's not necessarily uh, the sexual or the romantic aspect, but it is just the family aspect that comes with the presence of women? Because if yes, Mm -hmm. it, 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 may seem counter, it may seem counterintuitive, 
because you brought up the romantic atmosphere. This is the first thing that people think about. Well, if you have young men and young women, there'll be all sorts of picadillos and all sorts of inappropriate behavior. <laughs> Excuse me. The, the thing is that I have observed, and I was a brahmachari for 10 years, so I have some familiarity with the ashram. I have found that young men and young women in the West are much less disturbed sexually if they're living in a co-educational environment. If there is a men-only environment, the, the men tend to become more uncomfortable. And it becomes like the forbidden fruit. Whereas if there's interaction in a restricted way, sharing sadhana, some forms of service, with very strict guidelines, never being alone, with a member of the opposite sex in the same room, no electronic communication, no revealing the mind. We train them in these ways. They're what actually much no, What do you mean by no electronic communication? No emails, no private emails back and forth or texts between boys and girls. We tell them that that's, uh, that crosses the line. That's not that's acceptable. Quite, that's that's quite behavior. strict. Huh? That's, that's significantly strict. So does that mean it's no phone calls also? Yes. Unless it's past the salt, you know, who's doing the offering? Just business <laughs> okay. for managers, okay? But, but you see, the, the young men and women in the West have had sexual promiscuity, at, in most cases, as an acceptable part of their lives for many years. And they have been experiencing the hurt and all of the difficulties that come as a result of that kind of behavior. So we present to them that this is a positive alternative. Just give it a break for a while. They're actually relieved to have some space where they don't have to think about all the drama of relationships. And we encourage wow. them just, this is a good place to develop a relationship with Krishna. So when there are co-educational student populations, the men and women being trained in this way, they're actually more peaceful. So that, that's been our practical experience. We also do not disparage the Grihasta ashram. Yeah. And we, we just teach a minute, the young I got, students. I just went, I, to backtrack a little bit, I got this yeah, point sure. that uh, you know, the, the proximity may not cause agitation because when they've been used to it in the past and it's not so much of a forbidden fruit because much has been experienced already. And I also realized that you know, dating is a big anxiety. And some, yes. many people would want a break from the dating, uh, dating game, basically. So, yes. that, so all that is fine. But uh, so the proximity may not create uh, agitation. That's fine. But how does the uh, proximity decrease agitation? And the, the, the two distinct things. One is the proximity may not cause agitation. But how will it decrease agitation? How does, so, okay, there's no romantic aspect. I understand that. But how does that create a family aspect to it? Unless you are going to say develop a kind of relationship and then there's a family or, or how does just the, because I have lived in the Brahmachari ashrams in India. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course I had no experience of a co-ed living. So I don't know how it works, but mm -hmm. I don't know how the presence of women in the co-ed will decrease the tension. I appreciate it won't increase. Because you already mm -hmm. use and you consciously want a break from it. But how yes. would that decrease? Because they feel, they don't feel cloistered. There is some outlet for exchange. It is not the forbidden fruit. Uh, th this is one of the cultural perversions, I could say, that came from India in ISKCON in the, in the late, in mid to late 70s. You know, if women were trained, they had to keep their heads fully covered. If, if they were passing a man, they had to look at the floor. They could not, they had to turn away. Uh, they, they were just repressed so much. That, no, bro, just uh, a minute. I'm just a minute. Okay. Uh, maybe it's the Indian ego within me which he wants to defend. Uh, All right. This, but... <laughs> no, I'm not saying, I'm sorry. No, I, because... I didn't mean to ego. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not saying this. You see, my point is that Prabhupada says, even the first canto of a purport, if I'm not mistaken, that if there is a woman cleaning the streets and there are men talking, so the woman just waits 
and then all the men move aside so that she can move on yes so you know this was that is that was the cultural standard yes and prabhupada has put it in his purports so i i mean i has i recoil at the thought of calling it a cultural perversion coming from india it's no, no, a cult- no. it's something like, uh, it's it's not a cultural perversion in india but it is a cultural perversion in the west this this is what we were just reading in that purport trying to do the impossible trying to impose one set of cultural values on another culture oh so um, that this could also go in with your point that the first canto prabhupada wrote before he came to the west yes in chapter 3 they are written after coming to the west okay correct Good point okay correct yes and, and and this goes back to your point is it progress for us to go back to a more traditional role and, and this has been the standard that has excuse me this has been the standard that has led us sorry no problem my apologies this no has been the standard that has caused us to lose our recruiting uh for decades in the west this idea that the more traditional indian uh culture we embrace in the west the more advanced will be in krishna consciousness this is not a criticism of indian culture it is clearly a superior culture it is clearly a more elevated culture it's clearly based on more spiritual foundations but it's not something that can be just imported and imposed on westerners successfully some westerners who get deeply into krishna consciousness may embrace these aspects of indian culture more freely in their lives but it's not equivalent with spiritual advancement it's not they they are not synonymous uh mm-hmm. let me just read you another quote from shila prabhupad here this is from a letter in 1974 the varnashram system is for convenience sake in the material world it has nothing to do with spiritual life acceptance of varnashram means a little easy progress to spiritual life otherwise it has no importance to us for example all my european and american disciples have no varnashram position but spiritually because they have followed the rules and regulations and also my instructions their advancement in spiritual life is being appreciated by everyone always remember that varnashram life is a good program for material life and it helps one in spiritual life but spiritual life is not dependent upon it. so th- this is the point where is which is this where is this from This is a letter he wrote to a disciple in 1974 uh 74, October 19th no? 1974 I don't have the No that's good I mean, 74 is quite late also oh, Fairly late yes Fairly late Okay um, So so the, this this notion that we progress in Krishna consciousness by getting back to the tradition that is what has crippled our recruiting of westerners it's the wrong idea The right idea is to treat people very equally to give them an environment which is familiar to them. You yes. asked about how could the agitation decrease by having coeducational environment. The answer is that that's what people are used to. They're just accustomed to it. If they're put in a single uh, gender environment, then it's, uh, it's less comfortable. They're not accustomed to it and therefore their mind becomes more disturbed. I I was going to round this out your question about this romantic aspect in a coeducational environment mm. by saying that we preach very positively about grihastha ashram mm. okay again this was something from the early days of iskon that was lost in the 70s uh, and yes. in, in the early days if somebody joined and they've got a little fixed up and they were qualified then they say okay now you can get married because you're a fixed up devotee to to be married at that time was a sign of spiritual advancement but that was turned on its head by the mid 70s if you're married you're fallen if you're married you 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 have given up your uh, spiritual vows even in one popular book on brahmacharya ashram life that circulated widely in iskon uh, there's a passage which says uh, everyone is smiling at the wedding but the groom has nothing to smile about <laughs> you know so much negativity about grihastha life and this is yet another thing that has crippled our recruiting of westerners the the reality is that that most devotees are going to be married i i would estimate 95% 
And this doesn't mean that those who don't want to get married are wrong or their behavior is inappropriate. It's just suitable for them. So both ashrams have to be encouraged equally. Now, what tends to happen when men are sequestered and only living with other men is that the grihasta ashram tends to get, not in all cases, like Chopati is very uh, exemplary, but in many cases, the, the becoming a grihasta becomes a very negative thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you're failing, you're giving up your vows. So we encourage the young men, yeah, take up brahmachari life for one year, two years, have a little bit more constraint about your association with the opposite sex, but be realistic and say 95% chances you're going to be a grihasta at some time in the future. So don't rush into making a decision. I know when I was a brahmachari, our whole spiride core was, oh yeah, we're all, we're all brahmacharis and we're all going to take sannyas. Yeah, no, who would want to get married? See, but this actually hurts our recruiting of Westerners. We, but we tell them, you can, you can be single or you can be married. Either way is fine. Just keep up your chanting, keep up your vows. And you can be Krishna conscious throughout your life. Then the Western mm. mind feels very relaxed. Okay. I don't have to make this heavy decision. <clears throat> and by preaching in this way, everybody feels comfortable. And this is how the family atmosphere is created. Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, this is this criticism of Grahastha Ashram is, which is, is very counterproductive. Because hmm. I think in the last maybe 10 years or so, not 10 years, at least six, seven years since I started going to the West, I may have practically used the word Brahmachari Ashram and Grahastha Ashram in my classes a dozen times, not more than that, totally. The several hundred classes I have given. Because that's not a relevant dynamic at all for most of our audience. As you said, almost everybody is going to become a Grahastha. Yeah. So that I fully agree that almost the demonization of Grahastha Ashram is terrible. In fact, uh, there's a lecture of Prabhupada where he says, and this was a revelation for many of your devotees when I shared with them, and the purpose of Grahastha Ashram is to be happy. And in marriage, when you're performing the yajna, you're invoking the blessings of the God so that you can be happy in the Grahastha Ashram. Yes. So that, that is quite radically different from the vision that it's, <laughs> it's just like a deep dark well in which you fall and you suffer and all yes. those things. The forest of material enjoyment. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so again, I, I, uh -huh. yeah, I feel there's a matter of context. The Bhagavatam is also spoken to Parikshit Maharaj when he is, is about to die and he has already renounced the world. Yes. So whether he would have really been encouraged to look at his family members in that way when he was in his family life is open to question. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yes. Okay, um, so, yeah, going back to an earlier, you want to say something? Yeah. I did. I just want to, to uh, embellish this just a bit more. Yeah. Uh, you know, our first teaching in our philosophy is you're not this body. So if the gender discrimination is very pronounced, there's a, a sense of hypocrisy. And the Westerners really don't like hypocrisy in religion. They're looking for it. So we have taken steps to eliminate any sense that one gender is superior to another spiritually. Okay? We don't discriminate. I mean, we don't, don't have any issue with saying men and women may have different natures and different duties, but on the spiritual platform, we teach we're not this body and mom, he part of your Everybody is eligible, equally eligible for Krishna consciousness. So getting back to some of these cultural imports from, from uh, India by immature devotees in the late, in the mid seventies, one of the things that used to be present in the temples was that there was no women's side or men's side, front or back. Everyone just kind of gathered in front of the deities. That's how it was in the early days of ISKCON. That was the family atmosphere. Everyone felt so comfortable. Uh, then women were told to stand in the back, and then, then women were given half of the temple room. That's been the evolution. So we do that at Krishna House. Women have one side, men have the other side. But 
every temple you go to, you'll see these, the same practice, that when the, the ghee lamp comes off the altar, what happens? Well, it goes to the men's side first, right? Mm. It goes to all the men will take it, the honor, and then all the women. Now think about the subtle message that sends to the Western mind. Uh, that the, the Westerner sees, well, here women are treated as second-class citizens. Westerners don't like that. So at Krishna House, we just have a simple policy. Men or women may take the ghee lamp, and then they take it to whomever is closest, men's side, women's side. Uh, everything except the flower. The flower is a little too intimate. So we have two flowers. One flower is given to the men, one is given to the women. Okay. These are very, they're very small things, but I, I hope you understand. These are the, the lengths to which we have gone to show women that they are welcome in ISKCON, that they are equals with the men in terms of their spiritual opportunity. Women lead kirtans. Women give classes as often as the men. And there's just no discrimination. This was what creates a family atmosphere. This is what brings the Westerners into the temples. And this is what makes them enthusiastic devotees and preachers of Krishna consciousness. Mm. Yeah, this is... No, no. Would uh, they do this in India? I'm sorry if I'm... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, we, we tell them, look, when you go to India, it's not going to be like this. When you go to other temples in North America, it's not going to be like this. So we try to prepare them to come into a society where some of these gender discriminations are more... Uh, are more internalized or more embedded <laughs> okay yes true. so i appreciate this when I, I had noticed this when i had come to krishna house and i remember when i was giving the bhagavatam class and normally we have verse recitation i said ladies so you said we don't have that i had appreciated yeah. that and it's it's attention to subtlety which is quite uh, i would say it's 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 profound so just a few points to trace it backward Yes. See, I am uncomfortable with the characterization of uh, the distancing among the genders that is in India huh. as a manifestation of the bodily conception or the separate treatment of men and women as a, as a result of the bodily conception. Yes. Because you know, if we do that, then it is... Uh, then we are basically calling the whole tradition as based on bodily conception because the division of roles and the distancing between the genders uh, has been very much a part of the tradition. Yes. So, so you know, I, I just let me put the other side also. That I find that labeling the tradition or labeling what is go going on in India or what is propagated in India, and it has not always been propagated in India. India is also changing now. But calling that as a bodily conception is, I feel, very polarizing. And yeah. conversely, like you said that uh, what you're doing is not feminism. But I see the Indians are, are the, and again, it's not Indians. Often many devotees who are born in the West and they have come to India and they have become conservative. So even they may be in that category. So they label this as feminism. So I feel bodily conception, feminism, these two are labels which are quite polarizing. And um, let's, I mean, we, maybe if you like, we could discuss both of these. Okay. So there is a certain amount of gender, the word discrimination has a hard sense to it, has a harsh sense to it. Mm -hmm. So there is a certain amount of gender distancing and gender differentiation that is integral to uh, Indian culture, and I would say it's not just Indian culture, it was there even in the West. Maybe if you go back 50 or 100 years ago, it was not so much that men and women would mingle freely. So it's relatively recent. Mm, uh, so, for example, if you consider the British society 200 years ago, now there would be very formalized occasions when, say, the lords and the ladies, when they would have a woman coming out into the, for having a season and only during the dances they would meet. At that time, they couldn't just even casually chat. So there was a distance. So that distancing was there in all traditions. So, and it was a, in India, it was a part of a, maybe it was based on a spiritual understanding. 
so calling calling what has been a part of the spiritual tradition of india what has been a part of humanity tradition across the world as as simply bodily conception i feel is unfair and counterproductive so what what from what you when i also commented this point that also oh, there are no email no electronic communication i said that's quite strict so it's more that there has to be certain amount of gender differentiation and gender distancing but yes. what the specifics will be will be different so the specifics of how the boundaries are marked they can yes. be different but yes. to call the yes. more rigid boundary as bodily conception and to call a less rigid boundary as feminism i think that is just labeling and polarizing ah huh. well I go back to Prabhupada's statement about how you would present things differently in India and in the West. Yes. So, so I fully appreciate that, Prabhu. I was just comfort, yeah. uncomfortable with the labeling of the bodily conception. That's my only point. Okay. No, I understand. Um, yes. If if I have implied that the gender distancing in India is based on the bodily conception, then I have not communicated my point clearly. I'm talking about in terms of what the Western mind, how the Western mind perceives it. Now, we have four regulative principles and 16 rounds, and maybe Trinata Peace Unichena. You could say these are inviolable principles of Krishna consciousness. Hmm. The rest are details. How the gender distancing is there, uh, all these social things. I think we can agree these are details of devotional service. Hmm. they're not principles and probably was asked how do you differentiate between a detail and a principle he said that takes some intelligence yeah so the gender distancing is done one way in india and another way in the west hmm. it's a detail if the west turns to india and says this is bodily concept that's not uh, correct it's actually a very civilized and elevated culture if the india says to the west well this is feminism well that's a misunderstanding because our point is to apply spiritual principles equally between the genders in a way that that is that works for this population mm. so that may appear to from the indian point of view to be a mundane equalization of of men's and women's rights but that isn't the point at all the point is to bring men and women to the spiritual platform in a way that is successful for them yeah people have <laughs> given up isn't it i mean i i have to say so many people have just more or less given up we're not going to be able to reach westerners anymore you know going to uh, reach western we're not going to be able to do it it's impossible people feel they just don't know how to reach the westerners it's a lost art it was it was like a phase in the history and that's why i'm i'm presenting these points strongly i i just mm. need to convey to you that no it it is still viable if we do it without these cultural thresholds being raised okay. we do it in a way that is uh, accessible to the western mind and these are the things yeah. that make krishna consciousness accessible to the western mind So yes, to the, I, I, what I said is that to the westerner it is a bodily uh concept of life if women are socially distanced from men they say well this is just you say you're not this body but then this way for men this way for women isn't that based on the body Prabhu, I'm not arguing whether that's right or wrong I'm simply saying this is how the westerner okay. perceives it okay Okay and you may you may try and try to convince them otherwise and over time they may gradually become convinced but in the meantime very few will take interest in the Hari Krishna movement yes uh, and, I, I, and I appreciate earlier what you said prabhupad was very pragmatic so we need yeah. for our leaders at each particular place to recognize what are the needs and yes. uh, uh, and do the and give them the freedom to do what is required to reach to people over there so yes just a, yes for you so just a couple of points now when we talk about um, there is uh, 
now gender distancing i think okay beyond that when we go further overall there is a philosophy of uh, often krishna consciousness at least when it started we started as a we hesitated to use the word cult but we were a quite a cloistered movement mm -hmm. so often there has been a ethos of world rejection that and that manifests either externally as renunciation and acceptance and the, and the glamorization of the renounced order we could say mm -hmm. or it could manifest subtly as uh, as downplaying the the whole material aspect of life family career social engagement and everything else there that comes thereafter so now how much if we consider shri prabhupad himself from his example prabhupad was more of a missionary if you look at his own life he was quite bit of a missionary and uh, as devotees if we consider the indians in america they are quite well established in their careers they are uh, quite quite uh, well rooted in their family and uh, some of them are socially engaged also in terms of not just spiritually engaged but also socially engaged so if one is practicing bhakti seriously and how much uh, say when, how much do you encourage or facilitate people to go ahead and be ambitious in their careers and chart their own path in life mm -hmm. yes a uh, 100% just as the equanimity is taught between the brahmacharya and grihastha ashram so also the equanimity is taught between the various vocations uh, that one might pursue the principles of you know four regular principles 16 rounds those are inviolable those are for everybody but beyond that what you choose to do with your life is entirely up up to you and there is no pressure one way or the other i have come to realize over the last nearly 50 years of being a minister that the vocation of being a minister is a rare calling. <laughs> uh, and, and I look around at the churches in America, and I see there's one shepherd and 99 sheep. You know, we, we used to think that being a devotee meant to be a minister, <laughs> but it is not a reality. Most people are not inclined to that particular vocation. Mm. So this is, again, how we teach our students. Uh, yes, whatever your career is, whatever your pursuit is, do it in Krishna consciousness. Now, the, the Mormon Church has been one of the most successful in, in America over the last 50 to 100 years. And they have a system whereby young people will give two years of mission work to the church. So th this is more the line or the model that we teach at Krishna House. If you like Krishna consciousness, Spend a year or two as a single celibate preacher, uh, men or women. Uh, for the men, this usually means going out on traveling book distribution because our, our, the city in which we are based is rather small. So we have vans and they go out to cities all over the country and sell books, which is good for their renunciation. And their, that's sort of their cloistered time as brahmacharis. Um, similarly, for the ladies who are so inclined, we have various engagements for them, teaching, doing marketing, uh, helping in various ways as spiritual leaders in the, in the uh, Krishna house environment. So the point is, but we teach them, most of you are not going to make a career out of this. Most of you are going to want a more secular life, a happy life as a grihasta for the family and, and earning a living. And that's fine. It's absolutely equal in spiritual value to the life of the renunciate. Again, when there's a sense of samadarshina, of equal vision between the genders, between the ashrams, between vocations, I could add to that between gurus. This is another important principle in Krishna House. That, that we teach the students that don't give so much focus to your guru. Put your focus on Prabhupada. Mm. Uh, this, this mood of samadarshina, again, this creates a family atmosphere. I was yeah. speaking with a friend of mine recently from Dubai, and uh, he, he was explaining that there, there, he quoted the Hindi, I can't repeat it, but there's some Hindi aphorism that said, 
Previously, one's guru was a secret. Now it is published in the newspaper. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> That's striking. Huh? Yeah. And we yes. have, I think, a words by Jiva Goswami or Rupa Goswami, Gopayete. Guru Gopayete. Keep your guru a secret. And yes. Mantra also a secret. Yeah. Yes. yes. So we, we emphasize that this is part of the Krishna house culture. Mm. Um, and the reason for that is because one is supposed to feel that if people knew I was a disciple of my guru, that would be very embarrassing for my guru. Oh, to, to have a person mood. like me as a disciple. Okay, I didn't know that was the mood. That's interesting. Yeah, but we sort of turned it on its head. And now I say, my guru is so great. He even has me as a disciple. Look how great I am. And so I am making my guru great. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Okay. <laughs> so all yeah. all of these things Prabhu, contribute to a a mood which attracts the Westerner. Yes, mm. we have our gurus, but it's not a big deal. It's not a public uh, discussion. You know, that's the first question we always ask each other: Who's your guru? Right? It's sort of it's gone standard. <laughs> we yeah. teach people. Yeah, don't don't do that. Okay, it's not important. We're all followers of Srila Prabhupada. We have disciples mm. of 15 different gurus in our Krishna House community, mm. uh, something of which we're very proud. That's but it's wonderful. a family environment. There's no tension. Yes, bro. Amazing. <laughs> so are you planning to have, uh, I mean, I, I think we have already talked a long time. I will just ask a couple of questions and then if you want to add something, you can add also and conclude it. So okay. do you feel this model is replicable and have you also tried to repl uh, replicate it elsewhere? And how have been the results? And mm -hmm. I think uh, another question I'm going to ask is, I think you also written a book. Maybe you could tell a little bit about your book so that it could be available if someone wants it. Okay. Uh, as far as replicating Krishna house, at this point, no, we have not had a full replication. Uh, we are in process of doing that in two respects. First, one of our graduates has now mm. taken over the leadership of Krishna House. I have retired. Oh, so okay. that's the first stage to see if it can be replicated. Uh, oh, in it, terms of succession here just, itself. Okay. Yeah, not just dependent on one person but the, the principles can be sustainable. Hmm. Uh, the second uh, element is that these students who have graduated have gone to ISKCON communities all over the world, really. Um, hmm. And they have this Krishna house experience in their heart. And they have the ability to gradually implement or help guide these sort of reformations in various temples according to the needs and interests of the local temples. Mm. Um, now, I, I wanted to define Western at the outset of our conversation, uh, but better now, better late than never. Yeah. You know, we tend to think of Westerner as anybody who is not of Indian descent. But actually, there's a tremendous difference between those of non-Indian descent, say in Eastern Europe, Ukraine, Russia, then in Western Europe, North America, Australia. So Western Europe, North America, Australia, this is where ISKCON took root. And the Krishna House principle or the practices that I'm describing, they certainly apply here. I don't know if they'll apply in other parts of the world. I've never preached in other parts of the world. But sometimes people say, well, we're making Western devotees in Hungary or in, in uh, Ukraine or in Russia. But this is not the same demographic as we're dealing with in North America. It's not only a wealthier country, which gives people more options and more attachments, but these countries are very homogenous in their ethnicity. America and Canada and Australia, Western Europe, very diverse ethnicity. So it's a strength, it's a weakness, but it's a difference. That's that's the point. So what I've talked about in this presentation, in this conversation, I'm talking about Westerners in Western Europe, North America, mm. and Australia. Okay. Um, Makes sense. Okay. 
Yeah. So uh, we just all a quick, had... just a quick point about this in case uh, yeah. we can if we have the time we can discuss it. So what I found is that the traditional way of outreach works where traditional traditional societal norms are still prevalent. Yeah. So we are quite successful in Russia, yes. and although we are still not legal, Hinduism itself is not legally recognized in China, but still uh, at a covert level, there are people who are becoming devotees. Yeah. So it seems it could be a civilizational ethos that the traditional presentation of Krishna consciousness will work where the traditional social structures are still there. And where, so it, these societies are quite vertical. So there is authority and there is a subordinate. Yes. Whereas Western societies are much more equal. You know, it's more horizontal. And mm -hmm. I think that also plays out in gender relationships then. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I would agree with you. And, and so we, we have to be flexible. Mm. Also, the, the uh, Western cultures, at least in North America, much younger, more fluid society. It, it's, it's uncommon for people to be uh, very connected with their families multi-generationally. And, and people have much <clears throat> shallower roots. So that's, again, a strength and a weakness, but it is a difference, undoubtedly. So okay. will Krishna yeah. House be replicated? That, that's, that's my hope now that mm -hmm. I have retired. Uh, when this pandemic is over, I, I hope to put my energy there. But meanwhile, I'm, yes, I'm, my wife yeah. and I are writing a book about our experiences in Krishna House. It's called Endangered Species, Iskon Ashramites in North America. <laughs> Iskon Ashramites. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, it, it contains a lot of these points that we've discussed. And uh, so I, I, if, if, if say our viewers want to read it, it will be available on Amazon or how are you planning to, it will be available as ebook or? What I'm planning to do, yes, is uh, wrap it up within the next two or three weeks and then just make it available as widely as possible as a free ebook download. Oh, okay. I, I, I maybe put it on Amazon where it can be downloaded for a dollar. But uh, hmm. yeah, my, my goal is to distribute it widely in, in ISKCON to whomever is interested. Yeah. Okay. So to just going back to one point earlier, you know, when uh, feminism also has had many generations and hmm. many, now they call it second or third generation, which is radical or some people even call it toxic feminism. So, you know, when we give you always said one point is spiritual equality, not just not physical equality, but as physical and spiritual are very rigid differentiations, but you're talking more about social engagements and uh, opportunities for service. So what would so generally the results of radical feminism are, there is a rejection of uh, the whole family structure as a patriarchal construct. Mm -hmm. And there is, uh, there is almost a looking down of women who, who want to play traditional gender roles. In fact, there's a feminist who said that women should be forbidden from living as homemakers and, uh, and mothers. Says, mm -hmm. Because they say that too many, if that option is given, many women will choose that. So the, I mean, they, so they are supposed to talk about freedom, but they are talking about restricting freedom. And there is, mm -hmm. of course, a demonization of men as exploiters. And that mm -hmm. is destructive to society entirely. So where would you draw the boundaries when we are providing spiritual equality? And, and you're translating spiritual equality in terms of equality in engagement for service. So how mm -hmm. do we do the, draw the boundaries from it going into a form of feminism that is destructive? Mm -hmm. Yes. That destructive feminism is, again, ba based on a bodily concept. I am a woman. I am a man. Uh, so we, we give the same instruction to everybody, regardless of their gender. You have a particular service for Krishna that is unique between you and Krishna. What that manifests as will show in time. So all you need to do in your self-realization is pursue what makes you happy under guidance from a guru. 
so that you're sure you're staying within the, the bounds of bhakti tradition. And uh, your spiritual opportunities have no restriction based on your gender. If you want to be a teacher, you can be a teacher of Krishna consciousness. Whether you're a man or woman, it doesn't matter. If you want to be an administrator in ISKCON, if you want to work to make the movement better organized and give leadership, there's no restriction, man or woman. That, this gives people a sense of freedom and choice that makes them enthusiastic to be part of the movement. It's simply, it, for the Westerner, it's very important to remove these constructs that says you must, based on your gender, serve in this way or that way. Now, this is not to criticize how it might be done in other parts of the world. Mm. What I'm saying is that this is what works with the Western mind. Western defined as this North America, Western Europe, Australia. Freedom, each choice. Now you've understood mm. the process of bhakti. That's what your time in the ashram was for. Now, serve Krishna in the way you wish to serve Krishna. If you want to be a housewife, that's, that's fine. If that's your nature and inclination, there's nothing wrong with that. If you're a woman and you want to be a business executive, that's fine. If that's your nature and inclination, there's no constraint. Uh, this is what works. And, and it's, to call this feminism is to miss the essential teaching of Bhagavad Gita, which is that each spirit soul is part and parcel of Krishna and has a unique way of serving and must serve according to his or her nature. Mm, interesting. So, how has been the success of uh, this model in terms of uh, the stability and the longevity of family life, the families that are formed? Because that is not just a challenge in the broader world, but it is a challenge of modernity and it has also been a challenge for, I think, more for Western devotees in ISKCON. And mm -hmm. of course, as India is becoming Westernized, it's becoming a problem for Indians also, mm. but not to that extent. Yeah. So one of the one of the concerns is that modernity. Now these are all very big units: modernity, feminism, and then social family family breakdown. They're all big social issues. But there is some link. Now it may not be linear and causal, but there is some link. So yeah. how, how is the how is this your way of cultivating devotees worked out? in terms of family life's, family life's longevity and stability? We're, it's really too new to give a, a really well-documented answer. I can tell you we've had a learning curve, which has resulted in us presenting certain approaches to Grihastha life that we teach. Hmm. We, we can't impose because, uh, unless there are residents at Krishna House. But can't? The, the, we cannot impose. I mean, we can't say you have to do this, you know, people yeah. move out and they do what they're going to do. Yeah, okay. But if they want to be residents at Krishna House and pursue Grihastha life, then he, they, the guidelines are, well, the requirements actually are this. First, the men must have a vocation and a means of support. Before they, in fact, we encourage them, before you think about who you're going to marry, think about how you're going to support them. And, isn't, so that, when, uh, isn't that self-evident or it is not? I mean, in India, of no, no father would ever offer their daughter in marriage to a boy unless he can earn. So it's yes, not like that in the, the West. Th this is one of the causes. And again, this is dating back to Prabhupada's time where marriages would be arranged rather informally. Hmm. And with the idea that, yes, okay, the couple will be together and then they'll figure it out. But our Westerners have not been very always very successful in doing things that way so to help with the longevity of marriage we we encourage young men first answer the question how you will support before you even think about who you want to marry you know first deserve so is then this desire. primarily is this primarily for men or for men and women both it's very strict for men okay very strict for men don't even think about if you want to be an ashramite, we will help you. We will give men some period of time where they can live in the ashram with no financial obligation and very little service obligation so that they can pursue their, their vocational development. 
if they have been as serving as brahmacharis or spent some time at Krishna House and learned and contributed, will help them transition, will give them shelter for that period of their lives so that they can make that step uh, to Grihastha life seamlessly without interrupting their Krishna consciousness. This is what, what I went through when I transitioned. Um, I was, you know, living in the ashram one day, but when I get, wanted to get married, I was more or less out on the street on my own after 10 years of service, you know. So uh, th this is the kind of harsh reality that has characterized ISKCON's approach over these last decades and has contributed tremendously to many failed marriages. And people were not prepared, they were not coached, they were not encouraged, they were not mentored, and just more or less, okay, get married and figure it out. <laughs> Mm. So this is part of the Krishna house training. Now, as far as women are concerned, we just tell them, if you marry a man who has not yet dealt with his vocational and economic responsibilities, then you will get what you deserve. Okay. And do you also have some norms for, say, courting or like that? Or... Yes, you leave it up to them individually. Yes, uh, premarital pre counseling, uh, restricted association. Again, if they're ashram residents, they can they can meet and talk, but only in public places. And then they they are al allowed to have electronic communication as well, or telephonic communication. Yeah. I think, that, like you said, it's just, if you started in 2006, it's still quite young. And yes. you do not have many devotees, yeah. We, we have the, learned a few things, yes. Mm, but we hope these will make a better track record for graduates to have long, successful marriages. Mm, yes, but one thing I, I realized over the years is that maybe a generation ago, there was a lot of respect for the institution of marriage itself. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, the person whom you married was secondary. The fact that you were married was more important. Yes. <laughs> and so most marriages might be because of maybe economic necessity or logistical requirement or, or political alliances or maybe parental decisions. So personal preference was no role. And just the fact that, okay, we are married. And like Prabhupada said, we will, we'll, have, we'll have to make it work. But yes. now, uh, one of the results of, uh, one of the unwanted results of egalitarianism is that, or, or liberalism is that, the institution of marriage has lost its sanctity. And so, okay, so I'm married, so what? You know, if I'm not happy with marriage, then why should I be in it? So I think Prabhupada, when he had those informal arrangements of marriage, he came from a culture or where there was reverence for the institution of marriage. And that's why he said, you, you'll figure it out. Yes. But in a place where you can't figure, where, where that sort of conception only is not there. If this is not working, why should I be over here? So then it's, it's going to be a challenge for any societal structure. And I think in India also, as it is becoming uh, westernized, or modern, I, I don't like the word modernized or westernized also, but whatever. It is becoming mm. more liberalized. Mm. Then these challenges are increasing. And as a movement, whatever we, we do, we will have to deal with the challenges. But at least we are getting, from what you're saying, we are let, get, getting people to come and practice bhakti and add Krishna to their lives. And then the subsequent life challenges, you know, we will all, they will, with guidance and with inspiration and experience, they'll figure it out. Isn't it? To some extent? Well, you, you know, it's, Srila Prabhupada arranged these marriages initially. And when he saw them breaking up, the first marriage that broke up in ISKCON, uh, uh, a couple of devotees from, who had been in San Francisco, Prabhupada had arranged their marriage at their request. He was so shocked. You can read the letters. There's so much emotion. He's stunned that they would be breaking up their marriage. He just it was incomprehensible to him. So I very much agree with what you're saying. And then after some time, he just stopped arranging the marriages at all. He wouldn't have anything to do with, he didn't want any connection with them. 
you see. So I'd like to tell you a story after Prabhupada's departure, how things were done. Uh, in one big temple the, in a big city, the policy was that if men or women decided they wanted to get married, they would go and tell the temple president. And then the temple president would suggest a match. Okay, this woman wants to get married. Uh, she might be a good match for you. So you can talk this weekend and decide. Talk it over this weekend and decide. So they'd have two days to get acquainted. And then, uh, so Monday, have you decided? Yes, we've decided to get married. Okay, then go down and get a marriage license. And you can be married. And then one, if you stay married for a year, you can have a fire yagya. So this one couple went down to get their, their marriage license. And it was very crowded, so the, the park, there was nowhere to park the car. So the man said to the woman, okay, you stay here in the car. I'm going to run in and see if they'll give me the license because you're here watching the car. And so he went in and asked at the counter, and said, yes, yes, no problem. That happens all the time. What's your wife's name? I'll be right back. Oh, God. <laughs> so the true, true story. Oh my my, my God. godbrother and God sister, but they're still married today. So. <laughs> but, <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so the, my, my point is that this, I, I can't speak to what's happening in India. What we try to do is build marriages on spiritual principles. I always encourage people, the first qualification to look for in a spouse is, are they fixed up in Krishna consciousness? Are you going to marry someone who's going to give you good association throughout your life? Somebody who'll get up in the morning and chant their rounds, somebody who will strictly follow the principles, somebody who's willing to offer all the food in the house to the deities like this. Are you, are you, Marrying somebody who's spiritually uh, compatible with you and, and equivalent. So <clears throat> this is the best I can offer to answer your question. We don't have that social history. This is a big weakness in India, in America, rather, uh, th that, that preserves the sanctity of marriage. Yeah. As you say, would you say it's exactly right? So what we do try to do is prevent the devotees from marrying in the Kali Yuga way, which is just on the basis of mutual attraction. I, I like to give them this example. As you say, you marriage... Say you, you preserve or you prevent? Um, based on mutual attraction, you try to yeah, prevent yeah, that? We try to prevent. We try okay. to prevent. You know, in the, in the 12th canto, it says in Kali Yuga, marriage will be only on the basis of mutual attraction. Yeah, Bhuta Yeah, sorry. Yes. Rati, Rati. Yeah, sorry. So we try yeah. to prevent that. Uh, okay. I, I, I give them this example that if marriage is going from point A to point B, you're going to go from point A to point B, and then you're going to get out of, you need a car from going from point A to point B, then you're going to get out of your car when you get there. So do you need to have a Mercedes to get you from point A to point B, or will a Toyota do? If the purpose is getting you to this next stage of life, does it have to be the most, why are you so particular about which car it's going to be? You wanna make sure that it runs, you want to make sure that it's reliable. But as far as all the, the bells and whistles and accoutrements, these are, is that really so important? So in this way, I try, you know, so you're to, saying the to car encourage. is the car is the institution of marriage or the car is the person whom you're marrying? What are you referring to by the car? The car is the person, the car is the person you're marrying. You could say the institution of marriage is like the journey, the transportation. Okay. And the car is the person you're marrying. So is it really so important you've got to have every little detail you want in this car? Because it's not going to last forever. If it will serve to get you to your next stage of life, then this is what's important. So I have God brothers and God sisters who, mostly God brothers, who have never married because they never found the perfect Radharani. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's many, true. many good invitations, but we don't have the advantage of parents or family as you have in India, which is a beautiful system. You don't have that in the West where 
the parents will say, okay, here's the person you marry, just marry this person. And they say, it's mm-hmm. not, uh, it's not one of our, so, so as best we can, we try to coach people, prepare them with this kind of vocational requirement, restrained association, premarital counseling, and mentorship. Okay. See, when you talk about uh, mutual attraction being the, there has to be some amount of mutual compatibility. So, you know, it's a little difficult to differentiate between what is simply superficial attraction and what is mutual compatibility. So one yeah. thing, of course, we could look at how serious that other person is in Krishna consciousness. Yeah. So then at least that, that shared value is there, that shared purpose is there. And uh, in, the, in the past, so nowadays there is a lot of uh, demonization of the idea that you should marry within your own caste or within your own religion mm-hmm. or within your own nationality. But, but in the past, quite often these designations, whether your caste or your nationality or your religion, they would indicate a share, a sense of sh- a, a, a overall guarantee of shared values and purposes. Because more or less you would have a similar upbringing and you will have a similar, similar worldview because you are brought up in this. So in that sense, those shared values and purposes would be there. Yes. But in today's world, we could say one is Krishna consciousness is something which is a shared value and purpose. But apart from that, how, how do in your coaching do you help them differentiate between you know what is more of a superficial or physical attraction and what is overall compatibility mm-hmm. <clears throat> well I, I, I've been married for 37 years and we were my wife and I were advised when we were considering marriage our charts were not very compatible <laughs> okay uh, but then one of my god brothers said, you know, serious devotees like this woman don't grow on trees. So we, we have found, despite our different characteristics, there's tremendous compatibility in our shared interest in Krishna consciousness and practice of bhakti. Uh, <clears throat> sadhana, really. Okay. So this is, uh, this is how we advise the students. The, mo- the main compatibility is spiritual uh, uh, spiritual commitments that's really what we're looking for in a good marriage so we advise them in that way yes. somebody who's as serious as you are are more serious hmm. and you don't bother much about comp- about say they mean from the same ethnic background or something like that that is secondary that can be worked out okay uh, um, yes quite secondary okay makes sense so, so you, uh, maybe, I mean, I will just try to summarize what, is there, are there any other things which you would like to say to as a concluding message, or I can just summarize what we discussed? Yeah, I, I think uh, you know, we've, we've covered a lot and the rest is in the book. So yeah. please go ahead. Yes, bro. <laughs> so I think we, we broadly discussed about the, challenges and opportunities in Western outreach. We talked about how Krishna House has started and you have got more than 300 devotees who have graduated and are become fixed. And we discussed broadly, I think, uh, two main challenges with respect to the, the presentation of Krishna consciousness to Western people. One was the, uh, the gender roles and the other is the overall presentation of the of life and career. So uh, you talked about how there's a difference between uh, that. I just speak to the points which struck me and I remember, and you could fill in if anything is in mind, that you know, when people grow up in a culture where there is, uh, where, there's a, where men and women are naturally together to some extent. So now then artificially separating them creates, creates agitation. Whereas if they're t- together within regulation, then that doesn't necessarily kindle a romantic interest, but rather it can create a family atmosphere. That was a subtle but significant point. And um, in some ways, so Prabhupada himself, so the, the big point which you made was that you are going back to Prabhupada as he presented Krishna Bhakti in the 1960s. And we as a movement may have got fix, ideated or fixated with 
with Prabhupada's presentation of, of his con in 1970s. And, and uh, there were several quotes of Prabhupada which said that uh, the mode of renunciation in India and in the West and in different parts of the world would be different. Mm. And what works in one country can actually not only not work, but can obstruct in another country. And uh, so we also discuss about the history of our movement in the West, how you know, Western membership dropped and Indian membership became prominent. And so your, your understanding is that the broader culture and whatever changes and trends are there don't matter because there are a few souls who are going to be interested. And if we just make it, uh, the word you used was, if we lower the cultural threshold, or rather don't raise the cultural threshold tremendous too much, then uh, they will come. And uh, we also discussed the, how the polarization can happen if you know, one side, the conservatives la label what is done in the West as feminism and uh, liberals label what is done in India as bodily conception. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is what was the traditional culture in India was, a, as you said, you are quite appreciative of it that it was a refined, it was a evolved culture, but it doesn't mm -hmm. work in the West. And we discussed yes. also the difference between feminism, uh, which is which has become quite uh, radical and toxic in the West in some ways, but it is just spiritually giving every soul the opportunity to serve Krishna in their particular way. And that particular way is not restricted or predetermined by gender. And uh, we also discussed about how now that uh, last part we discussed about the about marriage and how that is an ongoing challenge and we are discovering the way and you, you, you give people the resources to make the decisions and then how they take it is going to be all great is we will see in your course of time. Yes. That's what it is. So did I leave, leave out any important points? I mean, yes, I would just like to conclude by saying I, I do believe that the principles of, that uh, Krishna house embodies can be applied almost anywhere. If there's a will to bring the local population to Krishna consciousness, it can be done with these simple things. You, you, you need to give people places to live. You need to have leadership for them, somebody who's charged with taking care of them. And, and then you need to have the proper atmosphere in the temple. These three things implemented in any, any temple will bring local population. The, Krishna will Sorry, send the, the people at that point. Sorry, once again, the place, the atmosphere, and? A leader. Okay. Yeah, we wouldn't think of having a deity worship without a head pujari. So we, we can't think we're going to have people joining without anyone responsible for their care and recruiting. Oh, their okay. training. Yeah. So, yes. So thank you very much for your time and this very enriching discussion. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you for that excellent summary and your very engaging discussion. I wish you the best. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, bro.